Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today to hear Dr. Lenore Kerr talk about parts of her life that I think are instructive for all of us and wonderful to be able to think about. Um, she's had a life that's uh, worth noting and paying attention to. She, most of her, well, actually all of her medical training was done at Michigan. I noticed in reading her CV that you were born in New York City. I didn't know that about you, but uh, Lenore and I have been friends for a long, long time, and she's one of my most favorite people. But she did this work in Michigan and continues to talk like a Michigander and uh, to have uh, fondness for people that she worked with in Michigan, like John Sikorsky and others. She then went for a brief time to Case Western before coming here to UCSF in 1972, where she's been uh, affiliated as one of our strongest teaching faculty ever since. She's become extremely well known for her work with abuse and trauma and with psychiatry and the law. You might recall the children who were buried in a school bus in Chowchilla, and uh, she studied those children, wrote about them. She also uh, wrote about the Challenger space capsule when it uh, fell back to Earth and people died and the trauma of that on children. She's written a book that's become really a classic called Too Scared to Cry that um, is a very touching and moving book. She uh, epitomizes uh, being a psychiatrist and a therapist. Sometimes we've gotten to where we separate those things. Um, and yet, she has integrated her medical background, uh, even married an allergist and uh, having a, a, another medical person in the family, and uh, has always been just a delight for me to listen and learn from. So, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lenore Terr. don't have to move. And it's wonderful to be back here and to see uh, friends and, and uh, new people. And um, I'm going to give a little bit of a political talk today about women in medicine. And this is, in a sense, a rehearsal because I was invited by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology to talk about how women can help other women to advance in this profession. And uh, so I have written this. I'm going to read to you a, a talk that I've written, which takes only 20 minutes. But in this small space of politics today, on Super Tuesday, when we're having massive politics, uh, it's almost too minuscule to talk about. Um, so I do want to. Uh, mentioned today that if we're going to talk about politics, today is Super Tuesday. And another reason that my talk today is so minuscule, and it's just so funny that because of the timing, is that today is the coronavirus. And we, as psychiatrists, have got to be talking about mass hysteria and whether or not there is anything we can do with large populations to stop that kind of thing from happening. And again, it's a huge politics today, which we're not going to really um, be able to get into, because I'm going to talk about woman-to-woman -woman politics in medicine. Um, it's important, but I think the issue of the coronavirus and how all of us will work with populations to try to um, help them to get through this disaster, um, I think, is even more pressing. So my talk is called A Personal Take on Old Girls Networks in Medicine. And I will try to narrow it down to psychiatry. But for those of you who have um, comments and questions, there's going to be plenty of time because uh, this really does only take about 20 minutes to do. 
1957, when I began medical school at the University of Michigan, no old girls in network existed. Of course, I noticed back then that there were overt and covert understandings among the boys. The historian Harari, who's written the book Sapiens, a really interesting book, tells us that 30,000 years ago, hunters and gatherers spread rumors among themselves regarding where the enemy bands were lurking and where the best of herds were living. One might call these early male mumblings the beginning of old boys' networks. Today, that ancient tradition is taken for granted at prep schools, colleges, grad schools, training programs, businesses, nonprofits, religious institutions, charities, governing boards, and governments themselves. Such traditions cannot be broken by women or even emulated in just um, a sliver of time. In recent years, since women became the majority po population in many medical schools, they still have not reached an automatic understanding among themselves about the necessity of consistently helping others of their gender. When I consider my life in medicine, I realize that a number of men have greatly helped me but that's not the purpose of this talk today. I wish to share with you the help I receive from women, as well as the ways I have tried to pay women forward. I've come up with three forms that this female-to-female -female assistance takes. First, there's role modeling. Second, teaching. And third, direct one-on-one -on -one help. This talk will divide itself into two parts. <clears throat> I will begin by describing four women, Ruth Hein, Selma Freiberg, Marguerite Lederberg, and Anna Freud, who influenced my early career. And then I'll speak of my attempts, both broadly and individually, to pay women forward. From the examples I bring to this talk, it's my hope that one could see how role modeling, teaching, and direct assistance work together to enhance women's futures in medicine. Hopefully, my talk will appeal to those of you who are attempting, attempting to set up future old girls' networks. And looking way back then, I think of the summer before I started my first year of med school. I applied for it and I got a job in a mouse leukemia lab that was responsible to a University of Michigan pediatrician, Ruth Stein. This lab that I was working at was associated with a few local labs that were coordinating studies on childhood leukemia. Our little Ann Arbor group was associated with a much larger group. They called it a, quote, consortium. The way I remember it, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, few other research universities were with us. That first year of medical school, I spent my holiday vacations and some slow school days working with leukemic mice and an occasional rat. Ruth also let me watch and collect bone marrow that she and her colleagues were drawing from human babies and, infant and, and toddlers. Ghastly then, ghostly now in my memory. And a glorious success in the long run. Today, childhood leukemia is far, far more often cured than it proves fatal. But what I did learn way back then at the beginnings from Ruth Hein, she taught me how to consort. Rather than directly explaining things, she taught me by example. The near complete cure of childhood leukemia came largely through the work of pioneering women like Ruth, who rather than competing, believed in consorting. Sometime before I started my fellowship in child psychiatry, again at the University of Michigan, I heard an interesting rumor. 
the distinguished social worker, Selma Freiberg, who had recently written The Magic Years, a remarkable book on the first five years of life, had joined our faculty. I couldn't ask for Selma to supervise my psychotherapy training because in those days, physicians were not allowed to be supervised by social workers. <clears throat> But I made a different kind of request back then that could be granted. I asked Selma if I could attend her weekly lunchtime research meetings. She and her group were studying infants who were blind from birth, along with their mothers. They were making films and watching every detail in slow motion and in real time. And as I widely watched, as I watched and listened, Selma Freiberg role models for me. I took in the ways that she observed so carefully, how she listened fully, how she kept calm, and she treated everyone with respect. She avoided bias and took criticism well and always remained positive. What I didn't realize until a few years later was that during my fellowship years, I had paid Selma forward. Ever since my first year of postgraduate training in pediatrics, I had been studying physically abused and neglected young children and their parents. And occasionally, I would bring up my observation or my obsession, actually, with childhood trauma at one of Selma's research meetings. A few years after I left Michigan for a full-time academic position at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Selma's group changed focus. They became one of the foremost groups in America studying infantile and toddler trauma, moving with Selma right here to UCSF, and now in the capable hands of Alicia Lieberman. Between Selma and Alicia, one might consider their collaboration as a two-generational old girls network. But for me, Selma has always been a lifelong role model. The third woman who furthered my psychiatric career, this time through direct person-to-person -person help, was completely unknown to me when she did so. The aid that Marguerite Lederberg brought to me was entirely financial, and here is how it happened. In 1971, my husband, Abba, who's here, and I joined, uh, came to San Francisco with our two small children. For me, academic medicine had brought with it too much administration committee work for my liking. I love private practice and research, and I was just as obsessed with childhood trauma as ever. I was waiting to meet up with a relatively large group of youngsters who had all been traumatized in exactly the same way. I joined the clinical faculty here at UCSF, and Ab became Chief of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at Stanford. And we set up our practice together in a medical building downtown, and then the situation that I was waiting for happened. In July 1976, 26 Chachilla, California summer school children of various ages and backgrounds were kidnapped from their school bus and then subjected to a 17-hour ordeal. Left alone underground, probably to die, they affected their own release. Five months afterwards, through a series of lucky breaks, I began studying each child and separately one or two parents. I started working at Chapsella with no financial support. However, I needed research money to fully conduct a study. At a San Francisco grant library that was situated downtown, I found information on a Central California Foundation based on agricultural profits called the Rosenberg Foundation. I applied for a grant. What I didn't know was, number one, Rosenberg had never funded a medical research project before, and number two, a woman psychiatrist Marguerite Lederberg sat on the Rosenberg Foundation board. This private fund granted me the money for both a one-year and a five-year project, 
including a randomly selected and mass, mass comparison group from McFarland and Porterville, California. Marguerite Letterberg introduced herself to me long after she had pleaded my case to the foundation. She was working with cancer patients at Sloan Kettering Hospital, New York, and conducting research herself. Marguerite and her Nobel Prize winning husband, Joshua, eventually became dear friends of my husband and myself. But beyond the friendship, I will be forever grateful for the financial help that Marguerite engineered on behalf of my research. It was the kind of direct help that women to women networks must learn to foster. Finally, when I look back on direct woman to woman help that I received, I think of a meeting that I had with Anna Freud, Sigmund, Sigmund Freud's daughter. In, in 1978, I visited her group in Hampstead, England. She would not let me see her alone. And I brought with me a polished draft, or I thought it was polished, of my new one-year Tuxilla study. On the last day of my three-day visit there, Ms. Freud offered me her advice. And I can't imitate her German accent, but she had a very thick German accent. I say this not to discourage you, but to encourage you, she said, go back and analyze these children. For me, this was absolutely impossible. There were two reasons. First of all, I was not a psychoanalyst, as Ms. Freud must have assumed. But secondly, I could only see the Chowchilla kids maybe two, at the most three times each. They wouldn't tolerate any more. And then I had an insight. I would use Anna Freud's advice indirectly. Rather than analyzing the children, I would reanalyze the data. And in doing so, I discovered that very young trauma victims rethink their ordeals. They very often develop symptoms and behaviors based on this kind of reappraisal, rethinking. In the long run, this new insight led me and eventually others to important developments in the treatment of psychiatric trauma. Ms. Freud had given me direct help. Woman to woman, she told me exactly what she believed, expressing her father's point of view as well as her own. I translated her statement into my own language and my own point of view. And for me, it worked. My sense of gratitude for what has been given to me has led me to try to assist helping other women's futures in medicine. Some of my attempts have been broad, involving relatively large groups, and others have been individual, entirely one-to-one. -one. And I will try now to explain. First, let me speak of my broad attempts to pay forward. I served as the director of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology from 1988 to 1996. At that time, only one woman psychiatrist, Carolyn Rabinovich, had served the board before me. It was an all-men's, all-white board. I wanted to put together the best examining team I could. We were doing oral exams with live patients back then, and I decided to invite women, even those that I didn't know personally, to come and examine with us. I try to teach our team to examine fairly and non-scarily. I also try to role model coming into each examination room with what I thought were a few reasonable questions. During orientations and grading periods when our team was congregated together, I used humor, openness to new ideas, and assignments of important tasks to various members of the group. I developed ways to make sure that everybody, young and old, knew each other and felt valued. In one way of looking at it, my ABPNN team was a consortium of a sort. Three women from our group eventually became a BPNN directors, Elizabeth Weller, Kaylee Shaw, and Beth Ann Brooks. I'm proud of them. 
More importantly, I hope they were proud of themselves. When I moved to California to enter private practice, I did so largely, largely to continue my clinical research. I completed projects on ordinary school children's reactions in two coasts of America to the Challenger disaster, on traumatized children's memories, and on what psychotherapy techniques help traumatized individuals. One project involved a consortium of psychiatric colleagues from the U.S. and Canada. Each of us watched the children we were treating who were suffering from various mental and emotional disorders. We particularly watched for definable moments of change. When we observed something that dramatically altered the child's condition, we wrote a vignette to explain what had occurred and why it had probably happened. We then, as a group, published four medical articles in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, as well as a book, Magical Moments of Change. Altogether, 32 psychiatrists took place and took part in this project. Eight of them were women. Yes, the females accounted for only one quarter of the writing. It was clear to me, however, that one could begin creating networks of women by joining them together as research groups. It might be years and years before the effect would lead to women in medicine to be more automatically communing together, but it was a beginning. Now I will try to explain my individual efforts, one-on-one, -on -one, to pay women forward over time. When I served on the psychiatric faculty at Case Western Reserve, two young women training in our department committed suicide. I knew neither of them well, but I was deeply moved. It led me to make a promise to myself. If a woman asked for my help, or for advice about a patient, or looked anxious or depressed, I would invite her to lunch. Lunch is a very female thing. I found it useful in the way of subtly yet effectively helping women to move forward. I cannot count how many of these lunches took place over the years. I certainly hope that they assisted some careers Another way I may have assisted women is through psychotherapy supervision, seminars, and grand rounds. Gradually, my insights on trauma became well known enough that numerous institutions, even the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., invited me to come speak. Once in a while, my attempts to pay forward were acknowledged by a payee. A number of women I had never met, for instance, approached me, telling me that I was their role model. Some wrote letters to me. A few came to visit me in my San Francisco office. But one individual situation sticks in my mind most, visit, most vividly. A medical student who heard me present my first Chowchilla study at Grand Rounds here at UCSF wrote me much afterward to say that I was the inspiration for a career choice in psychiatric research. That was Tom Insel, the eventual director of NIMH. Unfortunately, for the sake of this talk, Dr. Insel is a man. I very much hope that I have done the same for women. I never was able to pay uh, women forward financially the way Marguerite Lederberg did for me. I am really dumb financially, and a foundation board would have been dumb to let me on. <clears throat> but I have given individual women help with psychotherapy, or with supervision, or even with advice about writing. One younger woman psychiatric, uh, psychiatrist journeys from some distance away to be my patient when she developed a very serious medical condition. We worked on that on and off for a few years and then indirectly treated her children as they moved toward adulthood. And finally she decided to 
buttress her psychiatric career with research, writing, and a move into academia. I began offering her political advice. It worked out well. She currently is enjoying a productive career at a university. Another younger woman psychiatrist wanted my help with a book she was writing. I reviewed her drafts, and we talked about editing, agents, publishers, and today her book sits on the shelf in my office. A number of individual women have also asked me for letters of recommendation. I say yes. Most of these letters are preceded by a lunch or a personal talk, and they carry a positive slant. I take my time and careful consideration. Whether or not they are read at the receiving ends, these letters come with my sincere wishes that they will help a younger woman's career. Finally, in producing examples of how I have paid younger women forward, I cannot help but think of a very distinguished but much older woman. I've always liked thinking about the processes of psychiatric politics, or just politics in general. People say I'm pretty good at politics. So one day during my California years, I spotted the famous, well-respected child adolescent psychiatrist from a different part of the United States at the front of an airplane that I had just boarded. I walked over to her seat, and I introduced myself. Standing in the aisle, I said that a new chairman was about to take over her university department. I knew about it from rumor. She tried to express her delight. I held up my hand to stop her. He doesn't believe child psychiatry should exist as a field, I said. He had once told me that face to face. <laughs> he will fire you when he comes, I told her. I went on. Simply refuse to leave. Have a complete list of your alumni, current and ready. Muster your alumni support. Get them to write letters. Organize a serious protest. You will prevail. With that said, I went back to my seat at the rear of the airplane. It all came true. He did exactly what I expected. And she did what I advised. He did not last a year as chairman. Years afterward, a younger psychiatrist on the older woman's faculty told me that she wasn't doing well mentally. What's the problem, I said. Well, she still makes sense, and she was still training outstanding child and adolescent psychiatrists, but she had turned a little dot. Gotti, he said, psychiatric talk. <clears throat> she talks about having had a visitation, he said. She says she saw an angel on an airplane. My Lord, what a misunderstanding. I had introduced myself by name and my profession. I explained the facts to the young man, and I asked him to straighten his boss out. From then on, in fact, I have been consistently invited to her university's annual cocktail party. To summarize this talk, then, women in medicine very much need to develop old girls' networks. Teaching, role modeling, and direct assistance are the three crucial elements to establishing these networks. Positivity is absolutely necessary. Warmth and good humor help. We women must learn to rule out cattiness, fierce opposition, cutthroat competition, and backstabbing. Unfortunately, that still exists. To widen the road to success for women in medicine, we must make conscious vows in our own minds to think backward and to pay forward. In the long run, these vows may create old girls' networks. Anita. So I really want to hear from you. 
And I want Bob to moderate here, so please. Call on people, but what a lovely talk. Well, thank you. Very nice. Comments? Questions? Please, I see people here who know lots about this. I start off by asking if you're a young woman wanting to have someone like you be a mentor. How does one, so you've talked about how from your perspective it can be helpful, but how could someone help find somebody? And does it always have to be a woman? Well, I think that men are extremely helpful to women's careers, and I don't, I, I really don't want to underestimate me. I mean, when I think about some of the men who've helped my career, uh, you know, they've been invaluable. But I think there is something special about women to women contact. And I think that if a younger woman or if an older woman wanted uh, to have a talk, I think lunch is, it, lunch between women is really a good thing. I, hopefully you all have enough time for lunches. And um, I think if a younger woman who I didn't know asked me to have a lunch, I, I would find a place near my office and have a lunch. And I, I have had so many of those lunches that I really can't, I, by the time I was asked to give this talk, I, I don't know how many I've had. I would say somewhere in the range between 50 and 100, but I, I don't know. Um, and I, many of these women I don't see again because they come from different places. But I think that if you were a younger woman and you wanted to know an older woman or somebody who had a career, you would say, can we have a lunch? I want to hear about your career and I want to see what you've done. Or, uh, or you might even say, I'm having a political problem I, 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 at my university and I want to talk about it. I don't know if you're televising this today, uh, you know, if it's going out to other people, but, you know, I would say, you know, if I get 20 invitations to lunch, I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to pick them up. Uh, I, I really do think that, that lunches are, are one way um, that this can be done, and I, I would recommend, you know, not Starbucks. Uh, I would recommend something that was quiet enough that you could sit down at a table and talk. I see women who have stories to tell. With Marty, uh, Marty Horowitz. Okay, you're not a woman, but you did. the things that women <clears throat> over 30,000 years that oh yes please, please do that so please do that yes. Dr. Horowitz asked if there were things that um, uh, younger women somehow I got so caught up into that but um, particular issues that you've gone through that you think would be important that you could identify for people and how you handle them cattiness and competition about among women is it's still awful. Um, I remember we were sitting in a, in, you know how seminars among residents sometimes get personal and we were talking about pregnancy in some seminar in Michigan. And I remember saying that I had been so uncomfortable in my pregnancies, especially with patients who were trying to touch my belly or who were grabbing for me or, or whistling or whatever. And another woman at the same table said, oh, I've never been happier than during my pregnancy. I mean, it was like a, a competition between us about I'm unhappy in my pregnancy, therefore I'm less good than she is, and I, I shouldn't have made this confession in the, in the seminar. But um, 
unfortunately, women among themselves have tended to be too competitive and too catty, and they don't really promote each other enough. And, um, I mean, I ran into this from the time uh, that I started training. Uh, that one, uh, you know, is really clear in my mind. But there were other ones. Uh, even trying to get on the board, I, I didn't try that hard to get on the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. But there was terrible competition between me and another woman who was trying to get on the board. And the things that were being said were kind of awful nationally. And um, it's, it, I, I, I sort of regret that afterward I didn't get to really have a good talk with that other woman who was trying to get on the board at the time. And um, I don't think we've ever really had a talk ever since then, and should have. So, I mean, you know, for, for things like a national position or or who's going to be on this seminar or that seminar, I think that women have not really held each other's hands well enough. Uh, and that makes me sad. Uh, the competition, the cattiness, the backbiting, uh, it's not quite... Among men, it's much more open. Okay, they'll have a debate. Uh, but um, it's, it, it's more open and more evident among men. But among women, it's, it's much more subtle and a little in its own way nastier. Please. How did you develop a good understanding of politics? I, I you know, it's hard to know. Um, my mom was a working mom. She was a children's librarian. And she had um, very definite ideas about, like, that if a child wanted to read an adult book, they had every right to, but they should discuss it later with somebody. So when I was really little, I was reading all the psychiatry books, not because I had any idea I was going to be a psychiatrist, but I only read them for the cases, not for what the psychiatrist said about them. And, um, and they had them. Then they had some sex books in the back of the library, and I wanted to see those. And as long as I read them and could talk to somebody about them, they were fine. And I was 10 years old reading this stuff. So... I know one of the things that was open to me that was not open to a lot of girls it was just the world's literature. I loved the Greek myths. I did not like the fairy tales. I read all the Greek myths and how the Greeks handled each other. Uh, and some of that was very political. I mean, the way the gods carried on, and um, even in books for children about about those guys. I, I still on the New York Times crossword puzzle. I can get all the Greeks in right away. I, uh, but there were certain things, um, I think, in a childhood that, that can lead to an understanding of politics. Uh, the myths, they don't all come out really well. A lot of people get killed. Icarus is too... He's too ego-bound, and um, he gets killed by the sun. But a, a child gets killed in a Greek myth for being too egocentric. Now, what do you know about that? Well, you pick up egocentrists, and uh, how much ego crap goes on with the politics is uh, extraordinary. So, I don't know. From what you read, I think, as a child, from what you're exposed to, I think my parents were very open. We always had meals. Uh, we always sat together. Uh, one of the things I regret with kids today is um, that so many family meals don't happen. Um, it's not the cooking. It's the talking. Um, one could finish a meal in five minutes but talk for half an hour. And how the day went and what happened. And even comments about that teacher or this teacher is favoritizing this kid. 
why, what's going on. Uh, and that's politics. And that's part of the family conversation, I think, in that half hour. Um, talk to me about your day. One of the things with children, I think, is the question, why? It's so ugly. It's such an in, uh, in English, why is a very bad uh, sounding uh, thing. Tell me about it. What about that? I don't quite get that. Could you explain it more? That requires a, a paragraph from a kid. And that paragraph can be talked about politically. Marguerite on the board of the Rosenberg Foundation was the fact that her husband had the Nobel Prize. So I think, you know, some women are married to very powerful men or are, 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 are involved with very powerful men, and they will get these invitations. I would have had to turn down our board <laughs> because I just would not. I mean, the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, I never sat on the finance committee. I, I, w I would refuse. Um, but I could help them with a lot of other things. And we did promote women. So that was the board that I sat on. But I do think if women could be placed on boards, and I don't know how they get placed on these, you know, heavily, heavily um, man-run boards. Um, uh, most of them still are not CEOs of major companies. I think that psychiatry really got women started a lot earlier than finance got women started. I think women, they're only in their first generation probably of running companies. Uh, so I, I, they're behind us. I mean, psychiatry at least had, you know, women for the last century who've been known and, and uh, famous and, and uh, well-respected. Uh, it's, I, I just think this is a 30,000 year process which is going to have to be shortened uh, and it's very difficult and uh, you know I, I carried with me today um, comments from two psychiatric newspapers about how women are treated and they're talked down to uh, they're treated as though they themselves are children. Uh, you know, there, there's this group, the, the migraine mavens. I think they're a group of neurologists who write to each other on Twitter. And um, they're writing about how they're treated in medicine. And they're like a little consortium of uh, something like 129 women who, who write to each other about their complaints. And um, so there are these little groups that are breaking out now. Um, but it's, it's not to just complain. It, it, it has to be to find solutions. And um, uh, it, it's, it's true. And they have to be positive solutions, not negative, you know, let's get everybody or they're not being politically correct with us or whatever. It's got to be just much more positive about what can we do for each other, how can we help each other, how can we promote each other's careers. the opportunities to do this mentoring or to be on boards or to do other things with other parts of your life? Well, that's always been 
one of the big things that women are trying at the same time to raise children and families and take care of their mothers and their, their ailing parents. And all those jobs have been put on the, on, on the backs of women. I think you need more mutual raising of kids. Uh, I think you both have to know how to cook. Um, I think when you're in a couple, I, I think couples have to, uh, one person, uh, Ab made the bed this morning. Uh, I just, you know, I was thinking about other things, and he made the bed. Okay, so I, I just think that relationships have got to be much more even so that women have more flexibility to think things out. I mean, I was thinking a little bit this morning, even though I wrote the talk. I, you know, I, one needs the space. And, um, yeah, you're, you're raising kids. But I think you, you both raise kids. And um, I, I think if you have these meals where you sit down and you talk for a half an hour, if it's not going to be a meal, it should be a... I don't know about talking in bed because people are starting to fall asleep, but, you know, I, I, there has to be a way that families can um, convey their knowledge to each other and actually create family networks. Uh, um, but I think that, you know, having equal division of labors in relationships is very helpful. And I think women get into do too much of this helping mode to, to everybody around them and not enough into sometimes, you know, just really thinking things out. to and to spend time with, always thought-provoking, and um, it was just a pleasure today. Thank you.